I'd be able to see us. This meeting is being recorded. All right, we're being recorded. All right, so um, that's a couple of the housekeeping things I have to share with you. Um, let's see, what else do I have to share? Hey, Lisa. Yes. How do you turn off the video? Same way you do with the mute. You just click on the stop video and it'll turn you off. Oh, okay. That's in the bottom left-hand corner as well. Okay. All right. And so as far as the chat goes, um, I think what we'll do is we'll have um, Katie do her presentation and because she might answer a lot of the questions that you have along the way. And then we'll go to the chat. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and we'll, um, when she's done speaking, we'll go to the chat and pick out some questions for her to answer. All right. So just if you have anything, throw those in the chat and we'll um, take a look at it later. All right. So I want to introduce Katie to you. Um, our presenter today um, is Katie Buckman. She is a PhD student. Um, she's at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And um, she is working with the North Central Illinois Bobcat Project. And like I said, I put that link in the chat if you want to check that out after the program. Um, she's currently um, doing some research on bobcats that are specific to demographics and the survival of um, bobcats in the area. And she's been working, you'll see at the bottom there with Ellen Audia. Uh, they've been working together to try and, um, as you see, They've trapped some bobcats to take some information. And as she was telling us prior that she's just come back from their research time out in the field. So hopefully she'll tell us some interesting things that they found out um, during that time. Um, I'm glad that Katie has graciously agreed to share her time with us and her information because, uh, like I said, I love bobcats. And bobcats actually lived in Illinois for quite some time. But um, up until like 1999, um, bobcats actually were threatened uh, in Illinois. And so it's exciting to see bobcats coming back to population surging again so that um, they are off the threatened list, the feather, um, threatened list. And we are actually seeing them up in King County, which is why I was excited to have her come and talk to us about where she's finding them and why they're actually here um, amongst us right now. So I think I'm gonna turn it over to her. Like I said, if anybody has questions they would like answered, throw them in the chat. We'll catch up with those later. Um, but I am thrilled to have Katie Buckman start her presentation on Bobcats for us tonight. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Um, I'm assuming you all can hear me. I've practiced a couple times um, whether people can hear me. Um, so as Lisa said, um, I'm Katie. I'm a PhD student. Um, Ellen is my other half who is currently studying for her um, her qualifying exams right now. So she was originally going to do this presentation. So I kind of just threw it together in the last week. Um, but I can usually talk pretty good on behalf of both of us. So Ellen and I are both studying bobcat ecology up in the north central area of Illinois. There we go. Okay, so our project is funded by the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, which you probably could have guessed. Um, Ellen and I are both PhD students um, at Southern Illinois University. We're based down in Carbondale. Uh, as I was telling Lisa, we are entering our third year of this program, so we should be here for about four years. Um, we have two years under our belt now, so two years of trapping bobcats. And so my side of the project is studying bobcat demographics. So these are things like um, survival rates, dispersal rates, and cause-specific mortality. So if something happens to one of the bobcats, why? And you know, are there any differences between sexes or ages or things like that? And then Ellen is studying more of the spatial ecology. So she's looking at things like habitat selection, um, home range sizes, den site selection, things like that. So this presentation hopefully won't be way too long because I wanna leave a ton of room for questions because there's so many of you here, which is so exciting. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about you know bobcat ecology in general, then quite a bit about um, our North Central Bobcat project. And then I'll kind of just conclude with like some final remarks based on what we've found so far and leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, we'll jump straight into some general bobcat ecology. So bobcats are what we consider habitat and diet generalists. So that means, so a habitat generalist basically means that um, they'll inhabit a variety of different habitats. So they're found all over North America um, from as far south as Mexico to as far north as Canada, um, but they generally prefer forested cover. So they're really looking for forests where they can be kind of hidden because they are a very elusive mammal. They are also diet generalists. So they'll kind of eat the full range of everything. They'll eat everything from um, turtles, snakes, deer, um, but 
mostly are eating rabbits and rodents. And that's pretty common throughout their range too. Most diet studies of bobcats show that they focus primarily on rabbits and rodents. But like I said, they do occasionally go for deer, especially fawns. Um, sometimes they'll go for birds, but mostly rabbits and rodents if you see one with food. Um, home ranges vary, but they actually tend to be within this range for um, for most bobcats. So for males, it's about seven to 20 square, uh, square miles. I switched everything to miles from kilometers. And then for females, it's usually about three to six square miles. So for males, it can vary pretty broadly, but for females, it tends to be quite a bit smaller. And then survival um, tends to be pretty high. So these numbers basically mean that um, in one year, a bobcat has about a 70% chance of living until the next year. So in unharvested populations or unhunted populations, this is a pretty high survival rate of 70 or greater. And then in um, hunted populations, it's of course just a little bit lower. And then I included lifespan here because I feel like a common question I get in these presentations is how long do bobcats live? And the short answer is, I don't know. Um, but they're very similar to house cats in a lot of ways. And so I would say in captivity, bobcats could live a very long time. But because they are wild animals out in the field, we usually don't see bobcats over like the three to five year age range, which we can tell by their, their tooth dentition. So we usually see them living to maybe five years, maybe just a little bit longer. Um, so some seasons related to reproduction for bobcats, um, these are pretty similar throughout their range too. So in the spring, that's usually the bobcat mating gestation season. Um, the summertime is typically for kitten rearing. And then in the fall, uh, juvenile bobcats will become increasingly independent. So bobcats are very much, like I said, like house cats. So they have a gestation of almost two months exactly. And um, for about eight weeks, they'll stay with their kittens in the den. And then after that eight weeks, they'll their kittens will start venturing away with them. And then further and further into the fall, the juveniles will kind of become more independent and kind of move away from their mothers as we get into the next spring when they'll start, the females will start mating again. So females usually have one litter per year of anywhere from one to five kittens. Five kittens is a lot. Um, we usually see about two to three. And then I also put dispersal on here. So this is a type of behavior that we look for, especially in juvenile bobcats. So we define dispersal as like intentional single direction travel. So we usually see juveniles do this once they reach about a year and a half to two years old. And they're they're moving like this because they're trying to go and establish their own home range. So like I said, it's mostly juveniles, but not always. Sometimes adults will also disperse. Um, if they are short on space or short on some other resource. And then there's some pretty stark differences, um, at least in the literature, between males and females. So males will usually go really far. I mean, they're trying to get out of there to go establish their own home range. And then sometimes females will kind of just settle right outside of their mother's home range. So we usually see some pretty big differences in dispersal behavior. So... We'll go, hopefully I'm not going too fast. We'll go into our actual project and some of the background. Um, so this is just some history of bobcats. And some of this you all might already know, I'm not sure. So I apologize in advance if I'm, if I'm telling you all things you already know. Um, but bobcats in the Midwest experienced dramatic population declines actually throughout the 20th century. So as Lisa was saying, a lot of bobcats became threatened um, by the late 1990s, they became listed as either protected or threatened in most Midwestern states. And the, the main reason, um, I have agricultural expansion and overharvest here, but agricultural expansion is thought to be the big reason why, because it actually resulted in a lot of habitat loss of that forested habitat for bobcats. Um, they were also absolutely overharvested, but um, most of their declines are attributed to that habitat loss. So they became threatened or endangered in most Midwestern states, and those statewide protections actually led to um, some notable recoveries in bobcat populations. So in the early 2000s, a lot of bobcat uh, populations were making um, really good recoveries, so especially in Illinois. And then, as you all know, um, we actually had a harvest season reestablished in Illinois back in 2016. So what I'm gonna show you all now is a presumed timeline of the recolonization. So kind of how are those bobcats recolonizing the state of Illinois? So this is all based on fancy models. Um, and so, you know, you gotta take some of this with a grain of salt, but I think it will make sense based on the way that I explain it. So 
Hopefully you guys can see my little pointer here. That's not right. Let me get a better, my little laser pointer. So what I want you to focus on here are these dark green areas. So basically what this means is occupancy that an occupancy of one is that there are bobcats there. So they have some sort of confirmed sightings um, based on photos that people sent in or based on the habitat that's there, that they are certain that in 2001, there were bobcats in all of these dark green areas. So you can see in the early 2000s, it's mostly in Southern Illinois, right? So that makes sense because it's it's the Shawnee National Forest. And then we have a couple random little spots up here where we have bobcat sightings. And then some of this gradient here is where they predicted that there might be some bobcats, but they just aren't super sure. And I say might be because the habitat seems okay. You know, there's bobcats nearby. So these are some, some maybes as far as where bobcats are. So as we move into, you know, I have bobcat presence mostly in Southern Illinois, but confirmed scattered sightings. And then as we move into 2010, we kind of see those bobcats move a little bit north and they kind of go over here to the west. And some of these actually change, right? So there's some dynamics that have changed over time. And I'll show you all like a land use map here in a minute so you can see the forested areas in Illinois. So you can understand why they kind of went north and then they kind of stopped and then started going over to the west. So bobcats are moving further north and west following the forested cover that we have. And then in 2018, um, in theory, the bobcats were throughout most of Illinois. There's still a couple over here that we don't have any confirmed sightings, um, but they're kind of moving further north at this point, and they are in most counties in southern Illinois. And then this big yellow line here is that no harvest zone. So, you know, people cannot harvest bobcats in this general area here, probably because there's not a lot of sightings there. And it's just the Chicago metropolitan area. So here's a land use map. So land use map kind of just shows you what, you know, what kind of landscape there is. And this isn't a good one. I'll admit that this is, these rivers are very, very uh, well defined and the forest is not very easy to see, but there's a reason for that. And that's because there's not a whole lot of forest in Illinois. Um, so these little green areas here are the little spurts of forest around. And all of this white, I think represents agriculture and urbanization. So. You can see down here in Southern Illinois, there's a decent bit of brain. And this bright, big black yellow line is kind of a distraction. But basically, um, I think for this paper, it meant that everything, all the bobcat sightings before the 1970s occurred below this line. So um, like I said, in like the 2000s, we kind of had bobcats showing up down here and then they kind of moved up north. So you can see there's a good bit of forest here. Um, it kind of stops though, so it kind of all turns into agriculture. So then the place that the bobcats got to go is to the west, so they're moving over this way, and then they kind of seem to be creeping up along the Illinois River and moving further and further north. So it's kind of interesting because the, the history of the research of bobcats actually kind of follows that timeline. So early 2000s, bobcat ecology is well studied in southern Illinois, and that was mostly done by mine and Ellen's advisor, Dr. Clay Nielsen at Southern Illinois. And then in the late 2010s, bobcats are kind of showing up over here in Western Illinois. And we have some bobcat ecology research coming out of Western Illinois University. Um, and that was done by Davis. And then now we have bobcats popping up in North Central Illinois, which is some of the last to be colonized by the bobcats. And that is myself and Ellen that are studying those right now. So this is a nice, uh, I guess, that was me showing on a bigger map where our actual study area is. So this is a nice zoomed in version of that. So this is where Ellen and I are studying bobcats. Um, we have this technically a six county study area, but I can tell you right now, we've done most of our trapping in Peoria County and most of it in Bureau County. But this is a much better land use map. You can actually see the forest quite a bit more clearly. So there's a good bit of forest in Peoria County. There's not a lot in Woodford. Um, there's a little bit in Marshall, and pretty much all of that forested kind of follows the Illinois River, which bisects our whole study area. So um, we're studying everything from Tazewell all the way up to Bureau County. So our research objectives are to trap bobcats from November through March from 2022 to 2025. So we have three full field seasons is what we call them. And two of them are complete. So we just finished one. We just finished in March, our second field season. 
And so specifically what I'm studying is I am studying survival rates. So annual survival. So if a bobcat, you know, lives until the next year, um, I'm studying dispersal rates. So what is the rate at which juveniles are leaving um, and then causes of mortality. And then I'm looking at differences in those things between the different sexes. So um, do males versus females have different survival rates, um, different age classes of bobcats? Um, does it change within the different seasons? And then also the habitat characteristics. So maybe a bobcat that uses a really road dense home range, maybe they have a lower survival than a bobcat that has a much more forest dense home range, if that makes sense. And then Ellen is studying um, things like the home range size, habitat selection and the pathways. So the actual ways that animals are dispersing in the landscape. And so she's also comparing these things between the sexes, between age groups, and between seasons. So our trapping bobcats, um, we use both cage traps and foothold traps to catch our cats. And um, we also use a combination of different visuals, lures, and baits. So it's actually kind of funny. We use a lot of cat toys. We use catnip. Um, we use all kinds of stinky, smelly lures and baits. For catching cats. Um, you can see this is a cat right here caught in a foothold. Um, there's a piece of a bird back there that we must have used as bait for this cat. Um, and then we do all of our trapping, as you've noticed, in the colder months. So supposedly bobcats are a little more desperate when it's really cold outside, and so they're more likely to walk into a cage trap or hopefully step into a foothold trap. And then pretty much all of our trapping is done on private lands. Most of our study area in general is all privately owned land. So we very much rely on landowners to have access and to trap these bobcats. So this is kind of what one of our workups look like. Um, so in order to handle the cats, we chemically immobilize them. Uh, we use a combination of ketamine and xylazine and um, we monitor their vitals throughout the workup. So we're monitoring their temperature, their respiration rate and um, their pulse. And so we also will sex the bobcats, of course. For females, we'll check up signs for reproduction. So we can usually look at the female's nipples and see if she's had kittens before. Um, we will weigh the bobcats. We will try to determine the age based on their weight and um, their dentition, like their tooth wear. And then we'll fit all of our bobcats with the GPS collar, which you can see here. And we also microchip all of our cats and we take genetic samples from all of our cats. And then we let them recover in a nice little dog crate like this. Um, I actually put the name of this one down here. This was an adult male named Bergmont. <laughs> very pretty. And so we have very fancy GPS collars that we use. Um, they're from Low Tech is just the name of the company. So we actually program our collars to take one GPS point every two hours. So we actually have a lot of data. And then every ninth point that it takes, it will try to upload those points to the satellites, which is what brings those points to our computer screen and we can see where they actually are. Um, our callers also have a VHF telemetry unit, which um, stands for very high frequency. It's basically like a radio signal. So if for whatever reason the GPS caller part isn't working, we can actually go out into the field and like listen with like a radio receiver and we can hear like a ping coming from that collar. So we can also track them on the ground if we need to. And then our bobcat collars also have um, a mortality sensor. So within the GPS, if the GPS unit does not detect any sort of movement for about six hours, we'll get an automatic email, which is super convenient, um, telling us that the bobcat may have died. So we wanna go out and check where the last point was taken. Um, that way we can determine the cause of death pretty quickly. And then these collars also have, these newer collars have what's called, we call it a drop off. So this little black box here. And from the moment we take off this magnet, which is in this yellow tape, um, this is programmed for 52 weeks. So after 52 weeks, this will actually pop, like kind of pop off. And it actually causes the collar to break away. So the animal doesn't have to wear this collar for the rest of their life, which is pretty nice. So after about a year, the collars are gonna fall off one way or another. And then, the battery of these fancy expensive collars is supposed to last about a year. Um, it usually doesn't. Usually we have to start listening and monitoring using VHF, but hopefully makes our jobs a lot easier when we can actually um, rely on the battery for these.
So another thing that Alan and I do, which is really cool, is um, we're actually monitoring kittens. So I'm actually monitoring kitten survival. Ellen is monitoring kitten movements. And she's also looking at den site selection of females. So the way that we do this is we're looking for clusters of points. So this is a really good example of that. <laughs> so this is one of our females from last year. And you can see right here, this nice bright red point, and this one right there, there's 176 points within this little circle here and 130 points in this circle. So that is pretty obvious to us that she's been denning there. And these are actually both of her dens. So she had this first den and then she moved her babies over here and this was her second den. Um, so once we see females, you know, showing this kind of behavior, this really intense clustering, we can assume, okay, she's probably just had kittens. So we kind of estimate that part tuition date or that birth date. And then after about four weeks, we'll try to very carefully approach the den. Um, we'll try to locate the kittens. We'll determine the litter size, um, the sex of all the kittens. We'll weigh them. We'll put microchips in them. Um, and then we'll actually fit them with little expandable HF collars. And I wish I had good pictures of them, but we just ordered a brand new model. So I don't have any good pictures, but... They basically, the ones we used last year look like little tiny, like elastic band fawn collars, and they're meant to expand and also break away pretty, pretty soon. I think we're trying to get them to last about six months. Um, and then uh, at the end of the summer, Ellen will usually go out and she'll do some den site surveys. So she'll actually look at the vegetation and the location of the dens themselves. So when we get into the fun stuff of our preliminary results, we caught a lot of bobcats um, this past year. So between our past two field seasons, 2022 to 2024, we actually captured in GPS collar 29 bobcats, which is awesome. Um, we're on track right now to beat our advisor's record, which his record I think was like 46. So <laughs> we have one more field season to beat Clay. Um, but we, so we caught a lot of bobcats. We caught uh, 19 this year and we caught 10 last year. So of those animals, we've collared adult or 11 adult males, um, seven juvenile males. So under the age of two, uh, nine adult females and two juvenile females. So juveniles are animals that we think are under the age of two. So this is just a little subsample of all those bobcats that we caught. And then in that time, we've confirmed four mortalities. So we had two bobcats that were sadly hit by vehicles, um, one adult female and one juvenile male. And then we had one bobcat that was legally harvested, um, an adult female. And then we had one um, unknown cause of death that was a juvenile male. And that's a whole long story. I can talk about it if you all want, but something happened with his collar. And by the time we were able to find his carcass, he was nothing more than just some fur. So we really don't know what happened to that bobcat but we've only had the four confirmed mortalities so far and then some really cool results from ellen um, on the home range sizes so the home range sizes of our bobcats have been absolutely enormous um between all of these groups between males and females juvenile and adult the home range um, sizes have been between 34 and 38 square miles which is crazy and if you can remember, the average male in most of their range is about 7 to 20 square miles. So this just far exceeds that. Um, the adult males, so of six adult males that Ellen got data from so far, um, the average home range size was about 44 square miles. For adult females, it was a good bit smaller, but still really big. Um, it was 17. And then remember, we only have one juvenile female. Um, but her home range was massive. It was 96 square miles, just crazy. And that does not include her dispersal, um, her dispersal behavior, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we had seven juvenile males she got data from, and they still had a pretty big um, home range size as well. And, you know, we'll talk about this more later, but I think that this is a function of how fragmented that the habitat is up there. Like there's so little forest that these bobcats really have to move a very far distance in order to find all the resources that they need, um, but still really, really interesting result. So overall, um, as far as statistics, um, adult male home ranges were statistically larger than adult females, which is not surprising. Um, and then what she found that they sort of selected for as far as habitat was they selected to be um, closer to forested cover, um, forest edge, which makes sense, water, they they want to be close to water, 
And then one interesting result, which she'll have to look into a little more, is they selected to be closer to roads, which that could just be because the forest is close to the road. Like it could just be a relic of the um, the road density. But in some other animals, um, when animals are really close to roads like that, it could be just a sign of um, like colonization. Like for the armadillos, for example, we usually see armadillos really close to roads because they're expanding their range. So could be something like that too, which is pretty cool. And then over here, um, this is kind of a boring looking map and Ellen only has a couple of these polygons, but this is from one of our adult females. This was her home range. So she's got a nice home range polygon. Um, this was a different adult female. And then way up here in Bureau, this was an adult male's range. Just as an example of what we're what we're doing. And then uh, last year, we actually, we located one bobcat den. Um, we had three really adorable kittens, um, two females, one male. These kittens are about four to five weeks old. I think I'd say more on the four week old mark. So we weighed these guys, they weighed about two pounds. Um, we put microchips in all of them and then we fitted them with their little expandable VHF collar. So the collars only lasted about nine to 65 days, which is about up to three months. So the smallest female, it fell off at about nine days. Um, the other female, it fell off at about 30 days. And then the boy fell off of his at about 65 days. So we only know that they survived, or at least a couple of them survived up until three months. And in our whole season this fall, we never caught them again, which might be because the female's home range was just so big and we did not have traps out over her whole home range, but we never saw these babies. Doesn't mean that we won't see them again. We very well might, um, but it's kind of interesting. So they all have microchips. So if we do catch them again, we should hopefully be able to scan and see their microchips. But in the future, we're looking to have these little expandable collars last at least six months. So we've ordered some new ones, we've ordered a new model, and hopefully the ones this year will, will last a little bit longer. And then some really cool dispersal results. Um, we had three juveniles that we caught last year dispersed, um, two males and one female. So they all came from Southern, Southern Peoria. Um, the average distance that they traveled was 119 kilometers. So pretty darn far. Actually, in this case, the female traveled further than the males, which is kind of an interesting um, development. So one of them, the juvenile female, ended up in Rock Island County. And this is the approximate path that she took. This is not exact at all. But I know that she went pretty directly uh, west. And then she kind of hit the river and just started heading up north. And she ended up in Rock Island before um, her collar died or fell off, one or the other. Um, and then our two juvenile males, one ended up in Schuler County. Um, he was actually hit by a vehicle. So we were able to retrieve him. And then the other one ended up in Brown County. Um, it looks like they went together, but they actually did. They were off by um, about a month by the time that they dispersed. Um, but then same with these guys. Um, this one died, but the other one, his collar either fell off or it died. So the timing of initiating dispersal when they actually started this movement, I think the female was the one that started in October. So that's when she kind of left and started heading west. And then one of our males um, headed out in November and then the other one in December. So I would guess that these guys were about one and a half years old. So that's kind of some interesting information on them. So our future directions, what we're gonna be doing soon. Um, well, right now we're still currently monitoring 17 collared bobcats. And this year we caught six adult females. So that'll be hopefully a lot of kittens to collar. So that's super duper exciting. Um, and then we have one more full trapping season next winter and then one more kitten season after this year. And then we'll get to analyze the heck out of all this um, data in our final year. So that'll be also pretty exciting. Um, so kind of my final remarks is bobcats are making a comeback. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I would say it's a good thing. I don't know. Some people that we talk to think that it's not a good thing. They get worried about their chickens and their livestock, but bobcats really don't go after livestock much. They might get a chicken every now and then, but they aren't going to be the problem that foxes are going to be for the chickens. So I wouldn't worry about them too much. Um, another thing we found, I think it's safe to say that bobcats in fragmented landscapes need a lot of space. You know, their home ranges are huge. 
so far. Um, you really need that forest to cover, even if it's in very small amounts. And the connectivity of that forest is really important. Um, maybe if I have time later, I can show you, but some of those dispersal pathways that those juveniles took were just the tiniest strips of forest. I mean, just like barely a couple trees. Um, but those were really important pathways for them to get to where they need, wanted to get. Uh, they need to find enough small mammals to support their diet. And really, we've seen a lot of small mammals. I don't think that food is really a limiting resource for these cats. And then denning females appear to have pretty specific um, requirements. So that might be also why they have such big home ranges is they need to find really good places to den. They seem to like to be in a lot of forests, pretty far away from people, um, pretty far away from roads, and very close to a body of water. So we usually see them based on our female from last year and then kind of what our females this year are doing. They're kind of, they're within about like 50 to 100 meters of a body of water, which is interesting. Um, and they really like to den in brush piles. So um, that big pile of brush that you were thinking about burning, you might want to think again, because bobcats seem to like it um, for their dens. So hopefully this leaves plenty of time for questions. That was good. That was only about 30 minutes. Um, these are a whole bunch of our technicians from our crew. Um, we love giving them the opportunity to work with these cats because it is such a cool job. Um, and I did include my email here in case you all think of anything else. Um, but I'm happy to take as many questions um, as I can. I appreciate you guys letting me talk. All right, so we've got some questions here in the chat, Katie. We'll start with um, what we got here. Um, yeah. Sally said, why do they allow hunting of bobcats? Oh, goodness. That's a good question. And um, I wish I had the exact stats, but hunting actually brings in um, a lot of money for conservation um, throughout the United States. So actually the reason why we have a field to study at all is because of hunting. And I personally am not a hunter. I think I'm, I'm interested in going out and hunting things like deer, um, but the tags that people pay for, um, the duck stamps, all of the equipment that they pay for to hunt, those are all tax and all those taxes actually go to wildlife conservation. Um, that's something that I learned when I was an undergrad. So I would say that that's why they hunt bobcats. I'm not sure if I perfectly agree with hunting bobcats as simply a trophy, but it's hard to say, you know, it's a culture that I never grew up in. And um, a lot of our landowners really want to catch the trophy bobcat. And I adore our landowners. They've all been just amazing. So sweet, so helpful. And they really surprise you and how much they care about wildlife. So I hope that helps your question. Great. So with the um, hunting of bobcats, uh, they started in Southern Illinois. Uh, are they now hunting to try and maintain populations or is it like you said, hunting more for hunting purposes, trophies or whatever? No, it's, um, they're not trying to hunt to maintain the population. So it's actually super regulated right now. So um, if you want to hunt a bobcat, you have to apply to a lottery, which costs like $5. And then they only issue so many tags. I think they issue about a thousand tags per year, like a random lottery. And then of those tags, which you can see all this information on the IDNR's website, of those tags, they usually only trap about 300 to 400 bobcats. Um, so you know, just because you get a tag doesn't necessarily mean you're going to catch a cat, but they usually take about 300 cats. I might be wrong, but it's usually about 300 yeah. to 500 cats are taken. What's the population of bobcats in Illinois roughly right now? It's another good question. So we had a student in our lab. It was estimated a, like a while ago. I wish I could tell you what a while means, but it used to be estimated at like 13,000, but some recent estimates, some recent models ran by a different guy in our lab under the guise of our advisor estimates over 20,000 bobcats. So they're really, I think that the previous estimate wasn't including juveniles, but juveniles make up a huge amount of the population. As you can see, we had a ton of juveniles. So I think it was upwards of 20,000 bobcats. All right, so we got a couple questions here that are kind of kind of similar. One is, um, do you attempt to recover any of the discarded collars? And with that, um, have you trapped any bobcats that you previously had microchipped or caught before to see how they're doing? 
Yeah, so we we actually didn't have any recaptures this year. And um, something that we do, so what's important for our research is the number of animals and not necessarily um, recapturing the same animals, if that makes sense. So um, especially for my work, um, for Ellen's work, she only needs about eight weeks of data from that animal to know like their home range and to kind of know the habitat that they're using. And then for myself, I need about a year of their data. So it's actually better for me to have 20 animals and to know that of those 20 animals, 15 made it for an entire year than it is for me to know that five animals lived for 10 years. You know, like it's it's better for me actually to have more individuals. So we usually don't aim to recapture animals, but we do aim to recapture adult females because we are looking for kittens. So we did try to catch, um, we did try to catch one adult female we caught last year, the one that had the kittens and she was not having it. She was not, she was not biting. <laughs> And then we had one adult male that we were pretty certain, well, we know he was ours. We were pretty certain who he was, but we never recaptured him either. They're pretty smart. They they usually don't get captured. If they're juvenile, they might get captured again, but adults usually don't get captured again. Um, so um, and what was the other, the collars? Yeah, did you pick up so, the collars? Yeah, so if, if they're nearby and we know that they're nearby, um, in the cases of our juveniles that went way out there, um, it wasn't worth it, like us going out there and finding them. If we can get them, we will, because we can actually um, order new batteries. And so we can like refurbish the collar and reuse it. And sometimes I don't think that they have, there's no like extra data that's stored in the collar that we can't access through low tech. So, you know, we don't need to go back and get the collars necessarily, but it does save us a little bit of money. It's like one less collar that we have to order if we can. There was one comment about using the foot traps um, mm -hmm. how, how do those foot traps work? Do they injure the, I was assuming they wouldn't injure the animal because then you'd have a whole other issue, but can you explain yeah. why you would choose that type of trap versus, um, just like the normal, like caging them? The cage. Yeah. Yeah. So trust me, when I started this project and initially we just started with cages and then I remember, um, we got, uh, permission to use the footholds. And so one of our techs brought up all these shiny new footholds. And they, they look terrifying, like all shiny and new. And what we actually have to do is we, um, so we'll, it's a whole process. We have to soak them in vinegar to get them rusty. And then we have to dye them. Um, so we dye them so that we can remove the scent from the traps. And then we actually have to dip them in wax so that they don't freeze. And honestly, after you do all of that stuff, they are way less intimidating. Um, and these, these traps are also padded. So they're like slightly padded. Um, I can tell you that they have never, ever hurt a bobcat, ever. Nothing bigger than a bobcat. We've had one or two possums get hurt, but it's really rare. And then raccoons hurt themselves in the traps. But no, we've <laughs> never had a bobcat get hurt. And I think if we had one bobcat get hurt, it would be a very big deal because we are trying to help the bobcats. And so we definitely don't want to injure the animals that we're trying to help. So trust me, I was very... I am not a hunter, I was not a trapper. And so I remember that that foothold snapping at my hand and I was like, I don't know about this, but once they get out in the field and they're actually a little roughed up, they're way less intimidating. We get our hands stuck in them all the time and it hurts, it doesn't feel good, but you're gonna be okay. <laughs> and so uh, they so definitely long, have never heard any of the bobcats. From the time you set out the traps, um, how long does it take before you actually find them? So would the animal be there a few hours or days or I'm assuming not usually that a couple hours we almost always usually I think last year we had one that we caught um before the night that he was caught in cage and then um they almost always are caught between the hours of 2 to 5 a.m and right now we only check them in the mornings but I think when we we actually have to have our protocols renewed this year and we're expecting um, the protocol to want us to check them twice a day. So we'll probably be start checking them morning and at night, just in case for like that one bobcat that we catch before nighttime. But we pretty much exclusively catch them between like two to 5 a.m. So only a couple hours. Okay. All right, we have some questions here about bobcats and their interactions with other animals. Um, yeah. One of them was about uh, our bobcats and coyotes kind of competing is there is there kind of the same range things like that and also mm -hmm. um 
we have seen a decline in turkey population. So is the increase in bobcat population affecting those? So can you kind of speak about that? Yeah, both really good questions. Um, so for bobcats and coyotes, I feel like I can say pretty confidently that they do not compete. So um, coyotes are definitely also generalists, but there are a lot of studies out there. There's studies in Illinois, there's studies all over the US um, that show that bobcats and coyotes kind of leave each other alone. Um, they kind of use slightly different resources. And so they aren't really competing so much for food. Uh, Any time that we've had landowners tell us, you know, there's a bobcat and coyotes, it, whenever they see them like on camera, they want nothing to do with each other. Usually the bobcats are the ones in control too. Like if there's a coyote around the bobcat, like a bobcat is on like a deer carcass or something, like he will scare off a coyote. Coyotes do not want to mess with the bobcats. So they really don't interact that much. Um, and then what's the other question? About do they, the turkey population. Oh, the turkeys, the turkeys. So I hear this a lot too. And there could be something to that. I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done to understand the declining turkeys. What I hear from my advisors and the professors at my university is that um, a lot of that, there's a lot of things that can contribute to turkey decline. And a big one is just the habitat. So I think from my understanding, and I'm not, I don't study turkeys at all, but from my understanding, the turkey poults really need like super dense, like prairie type cover. And um, when we don't burn enough, we aren't getting that. We'll get, we'll get like very open understory. So other predators like raccoons, um, bobcats can get them, but again, they are not primary in a bobcat's diet. They will definitely go for them if they can't, but they're, they're definitely not a primary food for them. So I would say that bobcats are not single-handedly um, causing that decline. And I don't think that they'll worsen it in a way that it already is, but there's definitely room for more research um, into the turkey decline for sure. Okay. Um, next question we have here, um, you said the, the type of forest and, you know, we think of forest covers like this very dense, you know, complete canopy type of forest versus yeah. more of a woodland or savanna. Um, is there any mm -hmm. like tree type that you would see them like living in or choosing more so than I was like, we always have like oak savannas up here versus other types of trees or maples or others. So do they choose just the cover or does it matter what type of trees are there? Um, so I think what really matters is what benefits their prey the most, which might be more oaks. Um, again, they don't really go so much after deer, but um, anywhere that there's squirrels, anywhere that there's rabbits, I can't say for sure on the exact uh, species. Um, that would be a good question to ask. There's probably someone who's done some like very like fine scale, you know, what exact species. But I would say that if they are, they're not selecting for the species, they're selecting for the prey. If that makes sense. So wh whatever is more is best to support rabbits, which we see rabbits everywhere and we see squirrels everywhere. So um, they don't seem to be terribly picky when it comes to forested areas. But you can see here in these two pictures um, during the summertime, when we caught the kittens, it's very, very brushy there. Just tons and tons of green, which in Illinois in the summer, everything just greens up and gets really, really dense. So that seems to, to be a favorite. Okay, um, another question here is, why do you trap on private land versus public land? Um, simply because there's not a lot of public land. Um, there's a couple parks on private or public lands. There's like the Jubilee State College Park. Um, there's a couple others, but most of our study area is made up of public land or private land, I'm sorry. And um, honestly, private lands are so much easier. <laughs> it's so much easier to just call up the landowner and say, hey, can we put traps out here? And you know, you have the person that you need to talk to. They can say where you can and can't put them, where you can and can't drive. Um, public property is a little bit scarier for us, I think, because you know, we have to deal with the public. We have to deal with um, walking trails and things. And, you know, we don't want to put um, traps out where, you know, people might tamper with them or someone's pet might get, might get caught or something like that. So private lands are actually a lot better there. And I mean, I really enjoy it. I enjoy talking with the landowners and they enjoy mm -hmm. um, letting us come out and trap there. All right, let's have another question here. Um, let's see. What, um, do bobcats have predators? I mean, I know they're a predator species, but what's mm -hmm. um, 
size habitat loss, what is affecting them? Or are there any main predators for them? Not really, not really for an adult. Um, for for kittens, there are. So um, raccoons would probably get in a kitten, um, foxes, coyotes. But once they get to an adult size, they really don't have predators out here. Maybe a coyote, if the coyote was super, super desperate, but they'd have to be pretty desperate to mess with an adult bobcat. All right, the question here, do the males help rear the kittens? They do not. Um, but one thing we have seen, um, and we've seen it in some other, I mean, we see it in other cat species, is um, the, like if an adult female and adult male are kind of, you know, butted up against each other in, for, in terms of range, sometimes we'll see their kittens kind of go, like we've caught several family groups. So we've caught like a mother and then we've caught like her kittens as juveniles. Um, and we'll see those kittens kind of go into that male's range. So they could be fathered by that male and he's okay with those kittens going in there. So though they don't particularly raise them, he might share some of um, their range, if that makes sense. So that's kind of neat. And we've heard it before in like um, ocelots and stuff that sometimes males will, they again, they don't necessarily help rear them, but they will just kind of like let them move into their range to look for resources, which is kind of cool. That's nice rather than, Kick them out, yeah. find your own spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, question here. What can forest preserves do to encourage bobcat habitats? Yeah, I figured this would come up. So um, again, the forested cover, the forested cover um, and, you know, prairie is also really good. That's mostly good for the small mammals. You know, bobcats really don't like to run into too many people. And so if there's if you have like a really big property and maybe you don't go to the back of that property a lot, you're probably going to get bobcats around there. And they they don't mind some disturbance. You know, some are more brazen than others. Um, but usually, again, we can kind of look at like aerial map at this point. And Ellen and I can go, oh, there's bobcats there. There's a bobcat that's probably going to den there. Um, but yeah, again, just the forested cover and the um, the small mammals. Usually if you have those two things, and I guess the third thing would be not a ton of people. Um, you have a pretty good shot at bobcats coming through there. All right, so we had um, chatted a little bit about how, uh, at least in Kane County, they're trying to preserve these green corridors and connect all these mm -hmm. places you talked about, fragmentation. Someone had asked here about, um, you know, expanding that that watershed, the Fox River watershed, and how we're trying to protect all the areas around that, if that would help for the mm -hmm. growth of um, the dispersal of the cats. Yeah. And yeah, there's a pretty big distinction there. I would say when it comes to those like really small corridors, you know, you don't really see like an adult bobcat using that regularly in their home range, but you absolutely see dispersing bobcats use that, which is super important still, right? Like they're trying to get to an even better spot. So I would say that those corridors are important. Um, there's still a lot of research going on right now, including our own, where we're looking at, you know, how bobcats are choosing those corridors, you know, how much do they stick to those corridors. Um, but there's there's definitely a lot to be learned there. And I would say for those dispersing bobcats, especially like that female when she went west, I mean, that was all agriculture. There was like a line of trees that she followed pretty much. And she probably had to cross a couple ag fields to get to wherever she wanted to go. Um, but those were really important for her. So yeah, that, that connected forest, I would say is pretty important. It's more important than I thought it was going to be for bobcats, honestly. Okay. There's a question here about, do bobcats uh, pose a threat to people? I would say no. Um, I think it'd be pretty rare. It's pretty rare to run into a bobcat, um, really at all in person. I think I've only seen bobcats not captured in traps probably twice in my whole life. Um, so no, I would not say that they, they pose a, a threat to people. Um, they, they can be a vector of rabies, but not as common as other things like raccoons. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people ask, you know, do I need to be worried about my cats? And I don't think so. Um, especially if your cats kind of stay around and near your house. Again, they'd have to really get into a kerfuffle with a bobcat for a bobcat to really do anything to them or a bobcat would have to be really desperate for food to like attack your your house cat but i usually don't see it being a problem so okay um along kind of along those lines you know if if we're interested obviously we wanted to learn about bobcats we're here if we're out in the forest preserves what should we be looking for to see where the animals might have come through as they're dispersing or they're moving throughout their range yeah you know i tracks are good if you can see them 
Um, I meant to actually put some bobcat tracks in this presentation. I might be able to hunt some down in a minute. But bobcats have pretty distinct tracks. Um, I say distinct, but it takes a little bit of practice to notice them. Um, scat is really good. Um, and bobcat scat literally looks like a house cat scat. So you can tell the difference. Like, you know, when you see a dog scat, like coyote scat looks a little different from like a domestic dog, but mm -hmm. bobcat scat looks just like a domestic cat, exactly the same. So scat is a good sign. Um, you know, game trails are a good sign. What we've noticed too for bobcats, um, if you plan to put out cameras or something is what we call pinch points. So What's kind of nice in a way about the fragmented landscapes is that, you know, we kind of have an idea of where bobcats are going to go. So we kind of have all this agriculture and then we have like, you know, some forests over here and some forests over here. And it kind of like tapers in and at the middle, we're like, oh, the bobcats, if they're going to go from one to the other, they're going to pass right here. Um, mm -hmm. So those kinds of points kind of increase your chances of spotting a bobcat, especially on camera. Um, so we've gotten pretty good. And that's usually where we place a trap is somewhere like that or put out a game camera. So those are some ways that you can spot bobcats. Definitely game cameras are the way to go. Yeah, there's been a couple of questions about where sightings have been in this area. Um, I know in Kane County, there was a couple that were sighted not too far from St. Charles, South Elgin area. Um, some people have said they've seen them in Cook County. Um, have you heard, I know it's like, you said this is the last area that's going to be colonized. Have you heard any other sightings um, within like Cook County, Chicago metro area? I have not. Um, I said, let me go back to. Let me see if I can go back to my uh, my little map here. And no, I don't. I wish I knew more about um, sightings elsewhere in the state. I really don't. Is there anyone um, who's studying up in this area, like yourself? No, not that I know of. Um, I think Ellen and I are the only ones out right now. But. Yeah, so there have been some confirmed sightings up in some of these northern counties. I think this here is Kane County. Um, mm -hmm. So it was predicted to be, you know, good for bobcats. And then also if I go on to this next one, if I move this over. I was looking a little bit because I'm not really familiar with Kane County, but you can see that there's some forest, some forested areas there. So I could see them being there. And like I told you over email, you know, we say all the time, like the last to be colonized, but it definitely isn't. You know, there's this whole area still within that no harvest zone that still doesn't really have bobcats so there's always more work to be done um but um what's kind of unique about our research is not only just the place that it's in but um most studies of bobcats are in pretty forested areas and so with the exception of the study in western illinois we're one of the only ones that are studying them in these super agriculture dominated habitats which is really cool. And we've already found a really interesting result, which is that they have crazy large home ranges. Mm -hmm. But I wish I could talk more on um, bobcats up there in Kane County, but I'm just not sure. So within those home ranges, there's some questions about, do they prefer, I know you said they kind of move along the rivers because the rivers have the forested areas, mm -hmm. but if they're going to pick a site within that, are, are they sticking closer to ponds or rivers or creeks? What What waterway are they specifically kind of locating their dens or their habitat near? So I'd say um, for females, we usually see them next to lakes. Um, I think when you're like kind of zoomed out looking at the big picture, like in this land use map of them moving, they'll follow rivers, but they aren't necessarily following rivers regularly, if that makes sense. Like, again, they're really, they're really selecting for that forest. So they like the riparian areas, but there's no real good reason for them to like live up against the Illinois River. It's just too big. Um, mm -hmm. So they like those smaller, those smaller areas, lots of little tiny creeks. Um, like I said, the females tend to, from what I'm seeing right now of our females' current behavior, they're all kind of settling themselves near lakes or springs. Um, so they kind of like all of it, just not crazy huge rivers like the Illinois River. Okay. And there's a couple questions about um, size of bobcats, whether they're omnivores, carnivores, or if hawks or eagles or things like that um, would predate upon them. I, I know you touched on that a little bit, but can you just mm -hmm. a quick review if some people had questions regarding that? Yeah. Yeah. So what are the sizes of our bobcats? Our bobcats ranged, um, I have to do like the mental math of kids to pounds. 
But our biggest bobcats, we caught three really big males this year. Um, and they were all over 30 pounds and they were big cats. Wow. Um, the females are usually I'm trying to think. So females are usually the smallest that we usually call her is about 5.5 kgs, So about 10 pounds. And some older females will be kind of small. They'll be like six to seven kgs, which is about um, 12 to 14 pounds. So females are a bit smaller. Um, I think the biggest female we've captured was about 20-ish pounds. And then the males um, usually start at about the 15 pound range. And then they'll just go up from there. So like a good sized male is like in the upper 20s, upper 20 pounds. So they're pretty big. It's interesting. Like some people will see because like we let the loan, the landowners come out and look at the cats that we capture on the property. And we it's always one or the other. It's always like, oh, my gosh, it's so much bigger than I thought. Or it's, oh, my gosh, it's so much smaller than I thought. So <laughs> we kind of get both. Um, and then I'm sorry, I forgot the other half of that question. Was it the diet? Yeah, diet and um, predation. I know you had mentioned they really don't have predators, but there was a question about, especially maybe if when they're kittens, if they're smaller. Yeah, if, yeah. So and things I, like that. Yeah, um, we haven't had, I mean, we haven't seen a predation event. All three of our kittens, we didn't see that happen with. But coyotes, I know, can predate on kittens. Um, foxes, I'm sure can. I'm sure that raccoons could too. Um, I have a feeling with just how many kittens we're probably going to have this year that we'll we'll have a little bit more experience with that, sadly. But um, and then as far as diet, bobcats eat kind of everything, but really the rodents and the rabbits. That's really what they go for. But they will eat everything else. I mean, I study bobcats in South Florida, um, and they they're a little bit more inclined to eat wading birds because there's just so many down there. Um, there's some areas that they're like out in the West, they're more inclined to eat snakes because there's a lot of snakes out there. Um, but pretty much most diet studies throughout their range, no matter where you are, it's almost always rodents and rabbits, not so much mice. They will go for mice, but when I say rodents, I'm thinking like squirrel size. So. Okay. And there was a question since you mentioned that sometimes, uh, they're near roads as far as where they find their range um yeah. do they also have road do they eat roadkill if it's like just available they could yeah during the um during the firearm seasons for the deer that's a big time when you see a lot of animals come out but also bobcats so if we have like a deer carcass on uh, a property they'll come out for that they will come out for roadkill but i would say for them to get that close to the road they'd probably have to be pretty hungry um and, you know, that's something interesting, too, because we've had very uh, unseasonably warm winters. I'm sure that you all have noticed that, too, up where you are. And so we were worried that we weren't going to catch as many cats, but we've definitely been catching them. Um, but, yeah, if they're very desperate, they'll absolutely or maybe a juvenile would go up near a road um, and consume roadkill. But they will. They will consume dead animals for sure. Okay, a couple questions here. Um, if like a wildlife rehabber gets a bobcat brought to them do they call you um to say what do we do with this bobcat no i haven't had that happen yet that would be kind of neat if they did um no i haven't had that happen i've heard of like wildlife rehab places taking in bobcats and i think that they've been pretty successful because bobcats are far from domesticated and they're pretty sassy so even those little babies were pretty sassy so i think that they have a pretty good um pretty good release success, especially when you catch them when they're older. So, you know, I would encourage if, if you can safely um, take a bobcat, an injured bobcat to a rehab place, I'd say go for it. I'd like to have a bobcat to take, but <laughs> I don't want to see an injured yeah. one. Okay. Um, someone yeah. asked, um, with your research, uh, is anybody able to sign up to assist so they can see what you do? I wish, you know, I really wish that we were able to bring more people out into the field um you know sometimes we would take volunteers not very often one thing that we all have all the people in these pictures is we all have had to have um rabies vaccinations and that's paid for by our grant and so we usually don't let people come out and handle the animals unless they have the rabies vaccination um one thing that did cross my mind which is not nearly the same but if you if anybody up there ever does see a roadkill bobcat um, they can let us know if they see a, like a roadkill or a dead bobcat for some reason. Um, we will come up there and we will actually collect a genetic sample. So we are collecting genetic samples from 
anybody who harvests a bobcat and then any of our bobcats and we're actually sending those to Iowa, I think. And they're doing kind of a secondary genetic study. Um, that recolonization pattern I showed you guys earlier, they're kind of redoing that and they're trying to use this genetic data to see how related the bobcats are. Um, so it'll be cool. Hopefully we see how related our bobcats are, but it will mm -hmm. kind of help us understand how they're um, recolonizing. So mm -hmm. if you do happen to see a dead bobcat, obviously be very careful, but you can let us know. You can call the co a conservation officer and the conservation officer should be able to get in touch with us. They're, most of them are, I mean, maybe not up there, but a lot of conservation officers, if they start talking about it, will be aware that we're doing our work nearby. So Sounds good. But I wish um, I wish we could take more people out to the field. <laughs> yeah, that would be fun. Um, so cool. Somebody asked, um, do the bobcats like to swim across the rivers or in the water as, so as we part don't of getting see, around? Or yeah, we don't see it really happen. Um, we see the we see them cross creeks, which isn't a lot of water. Um, I can say from working with bobcats in the Everglades that they will swim, but they don't like to. Um, <laughs> but if they do swim, they're they're on a mission. They are swimming across. They're going somewhere. They're going fast. Um, but we, I can say we have not actually caught anything um, east of the Illinois River. So in that, you know, so the Illinois River kind of bisects our study area. And we have not caught anything east of the river. And in fact, we've done some trapping in Woodford County, which is east. And we've seen one bobcat on camera. We haven't done a ton of trapping, but um, we haven't caught anything east of the river. And there's kind of like a a rumor going around that bobcats aren't east of the Illinois River. So I would say that would be a really big feat for them to cross that river. Mm -hmm. uh, our two males that disperse, they never cross the river. Um, our female, of course, never cross the Mississippi. So big rivers like that, it's not impossible. But again, they would have to be so desperate for food or for some other resource to cross a big river. It's possible, but super unlikely. Okay. Had a couple people talking about where they've seen um bobcats. Someone's in Kankakee County. Uh said they've in Rony County, they've seen several bobcats down there. So if you think about how you've seen their dispersal, it could be that's a genetically different group than the one you're seeing if they're not dispersing across these larger bodies of water. Yeah, yeah, they could be. And you know, we also probably have bobcats coming into the area. I mean, Ellen and I have gotten pretty good, especially with the juveniles. You know, we'll see, we'll capture a juvenile male and just based on what he looks like, they usually are kind of lanky, like a little bit skinny. We catch them in January, February. They're probably finishing dispersal. They got like a big head. <laughs> That's like a thing for them is they'll be very lanky with the big head. And we're like, oh, this boy just got here. Like he just, he just traveled here. So, and it's kind of wild because um, we trapped in a lot of the same places that we did last year and we caught a whole new group of cats. So the density and the, the dynamics is really interesting for them. So that kind of leads to this question. I'm going to ask, um, what do you hope your research will provide? Like, what do you want to see come yeah. from all the information that you're, you're gathering and helping the bobcats? What would you like to see happen with your data? Yeah. So from, an ecologist, like a scientist perspective, um, I think it'll be really good uh, for bobcats throughout their range to know how they use really fragmented habitats, how they use habitats that are mostly agriculture like this. Um, I, you know, I think that any data with home ranges and you know dispersal, there's not a lot of dispersal data out there, um, especially when it comes to like, you know, when do they start dispersing? What are the cues that make them disperse? That's a lot of information we're hoping to learn. Um, there's not a lot of information on kitten survival because there's just no collar that's actually worked before. Um, so hopefully we'll learn a lot about bobcat kitten survival, um, about, you know, what they need in order to raise those kittens. And then from like an Illinois management perspective, um, you know, we already have an idea of how bobcats are doing. We know that they're doing pretty well. And so Hopefully we can also show that bobcats are doing well in these more ag dominated landscapes too. And, you know, the IDNR can take that information and do whatever they will with it. You know, they may end up increasing those, um, those number of tags that they put out. They may not. Um, but, you know, we're looking to see how well bobcats are doing, you know, are, are they doing well? 
and can they handle these really agriculture dominated landscapes that are permanently changed um, and they're going to probably forever be changed but will they still do well in those habitats and i think so far the answer is yes that they're actually doing pretty well in those so that's kind of what we're looking we're looking for we're looking to conserve bobcats and we're looking to learn more about bobcats great there was a question about um, bobcats if they were affected by covid19 it seems like we are all affected in some way. Um, mm -hmm. Were they affected by the virus or um, impact of the virus to other things or even what changed our lives, which could have changed yeah. things in their habitat? That's a really good question. And, you know, we haven't, um, we're, of course, we're not wearing masks in any of these pictures for these pictures, but we do wear uh, KN95 masks during our workups whenever we're handling bobcats because it is transmissible, as a lot of you probably know, and, but we haven't been sampling for it. Um, I think it's because it's not it's not something that we're expecting to see because they are already so elusive. But we do definitely when we have them down, we're always looking for signs of anything being wrong. So if there was any sort of uh, congestion, any sort of potential respiratory illness, you know, that would be something that we'd say, hey, Clay, like we might want to look into this. Also, those those unknown causes of death for that one male, um, like I said, by the time that we found him, he had. He was just like a pile of fur. That was so strange. But in the future, if we have unknown causes of death, um, if it's something that we're suspicious of, like if we're suspicious of poisoning or suspicious of disease, we actually have some contacts, I think at U of I, um, at the vet school that we could actually take genetic samples or send them the carcass and they could do some sort of sampling to see, you know, if there was a disease or something. So it is possible. It is possible that they can get COVID-19. We haven't seen any signs of it being a problem, um, but it's a good question for sure. It's definitely like one of our protocols that we need to be wary of COVID-19, the bobcats. Okay. Um, last question here. It looks like um, because uh, north, this northeastern corner of Illinois is highly populated, lots of roads, things like that, we don't have the same amount of forest cover, although the forest preserve wants to do that. Um, do you think that bobcats could ever have a healthy population in the Chicago area? You no, know, I don't think that I know that area well enough to say. I wish that I could, <laughs> but. But in general, again, in, in where you have studied, do they tend, can they be found in populated areas? I mean, Peoria is a big town. Yeah. Do you see them I've, like they they're miles away from towns and cities or? Yeah, it's tough to say because we, you know, we aren't looking in in very populated areas. We're looking in less populated areas. So it's hard to say. Um, I'm even trying to think in terms of like South Florida because South Florida is pretty populated. Um, you know, I guess just based on my knowledge. I would say that they're going to try to avoid humans. So I think it would be very rare to one day see bobcats like in your backyard. Um, I would say that they would need more space than that. Um, so I think that, you know, they will need those forested areas. And I think that they will occasionally use those corridors, like maybe in a very populated area. If there are corridors, it'll be more of a dispersal pathway for bobcats. They may There may not be a ton of like resident bobcats. Who knows? I mean, they might. Because right now it's kind of surprising us. And the more we learn, especially from Ellen's analysis and how close they are to urban areas, um, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, there are some smaller towns that are pretty densely populated, like Hannah City. Um, and they have like very dense forests around the edges and the bobcats do move around those pretty well. So I know I keep saying, I keep being a dead horse with the forested cover, but that is really it. Like if there's really good dense forest cover, um, you know, and they can kind of hide from your eye shot and they have food, there's a chance that they could be out there. Um, but as far as just like a, a normal public park in the middle of the city, I would say it's it's unlikely for them to be there unless they're just passing through. Okay. There was one quick question about um, their paws. Uh, like mm -hmm. cats, they have retractable claws. Um, they do. So they have retractable claws as well? Yes, they do. <laughs> they got so big claws, big paws. Big paws, but still have, like the, when you look for the dog versus the cat paw prints, the footprints, yeah. you look for the claws for the dogs and not for the cats. Yes. All right. Let's yeah. see if there's 
Any other questions? I wish I could. I wish I had pictures on hand. I know I'm not going to have pictures of their paw prints on hand. Yeah, the paw prints are pretty gnarly. Of all the animals that we release um, from footholds, you know, possums will just kind of sit there. Skunks, even for the most part, will just kind of sit there. We usually use like a tarp or something to protect ourselves from the skunks. Mm -hmm. I have not had to release a skunk from a foothold, thank goodness. Um, but like coyotes and foxes, they'll kind of just cower and just kind of sit there and look at you. But bobcats are crazy. Um, raccoons are crazy. <laughs> so I would not mess with a bobcat. No, I don't think that would be a great. <laughs> yeah. All right. They're looks very like cute. But Yes, yes, they are. Their pictures are very cute. Let's see. Let's see. Any more questions? Okay. It looks like we've gotten through all of our questions. Um, anybody else have anything they would like to add to the chat as far as a question? Anybody? Yeah. And like I said, uh, you know, you guys are welcome to email me anytime if you have any more questions. I love talking about it. It's a very cool project. Mm hmm all right. Doesn't look like we have any more questions, but um, thank you, Katie, so much for yeah. sharing some time with us and your information. It'll be interesting to see um, if we can actually get some more Bobcat sightings here in King County. We'll have to let you know. Uh, so yeah, you should. I, I'm something. very excited to hear. So that'd be great. All right. We're getting lots of thank yous. It was great. So oh, thank that's you very again. Sweet. You guys and are thank so you sweet. everybody for joining us. Um, you know, check us out for some more LFEs in the future and uh, keep following Katie as she's working through her PhD program. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is so sweet. <laughs> thank you. We, I appreciate your time. All right, everyone. Yeah. We're going to sign off now. Have a great rest of your eating, evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Katie, again. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I can hang here in case if there's anybody else that had anything else, but I don't have anything crazy going on. I can't believe how many people came to this. This is wild. Yeah, I think we had like 93 was the top number I saw at one point. Yeah, so that's amazing. That's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. very cool. And everybody's kind of dropping off. All right. Well, that looks like it. All right. Thank you again. And good luck with your studies. Thank you. All, All right. right. Bye, everyone. Awesome. Yeah.